welcome, Special Education Academy. We're so glad today to have Allison Scarberg, um, who is with Consolidated Planning Group. She serves individuals with differences and their families and helps with estate planning, um, financial planning. She's been in the business for over 25 years. She has her own partnership in business. Years ago, she started working with individuals with disabilities that focus on families with life threatening and disabling illnesses. And so Allison, we're just so glad to have you here today. Our heart is to equip people and share information. There's so much that families don't know. And I know that there's nothing more important than planning. And as I always say, we never get time back. So the floor is yours today. Tell us kind of what you do, how you serve families. And we'll start with that. Thanks, Karen. Thanks for having me today. Um, I think first I have to start with um, the why, the why behind Consolidated Planning Group and Allison Scalberg. Um, so like you, I'm very, very passionate about um, families with disabilities. Um, you know, and I did get started many, many years ago before kids, before marriage. And I was always so humbled. Um, I was part of the Children's Miracle Network and just seeing these families and how they navigate really rough waters and they're still smiling and they're still thankful for the little things in life and things that people take for granted. And I think that that time in my life was just preparing me for my own life. So um, I'm married. I have four kids. I have two with disabilities. Um, I have one that's still a minor and that one uh, that is an adult now. And so I've always been passionate about, you know, special needs. But, you know, I think it took a, a, a different turn when it's your own family and it's your own life. And what I would say is, um, you know, that passion just grew stronger um, navigating these waters with my own kids. I do this for a living. And what I would tell you is it's tough. It, it's tough as a parent, even knowing what I know and, and the experience that I have. I have over 27 years of experience and navigating the time of my daughter transitioning out of high school, um, you know, college age, transitioning, crossing that, you know, over 18 into adulthood, um, even knowing what I, I know, it was very difficult. So that's just really um, driven my passion for education and um, educating families on what do you need to do when and helping them align the steps. Right. That's awesome. So um, what does a, a special needs financial planner do that's different from a regular financial planner? So I, I have a guy at the bank. I have a guy that does my portfolio. Why would I need something separate? So I guess the analogy that I would like to, to, to provide here is if you had a heart problem, you're not going to a foot doctor, right? Right. Um, you know, we have a PCP for generalized things and we have a specialized doctor uh, for the, the things that we have going on that require special attention. And so when it comes to special needs planning, it's a lot the same. So we have generalized practitioners and I'm not taking any way, anything away from them. Um, many of us have the same licenses. They're very smart. They're very intelligent. They can manage your assets and those types of things. But the difference is, is the nuance of understanding special needs, special needs planning, as it relates to um, preventing families um, from losing needed benefits such as SSI or Medicaid. And for a lot of the families that we serve, it's preserving that eligibility because many families aren't getting any of that. Um, but they become eligible when the child turns 18 because it's based off of the child's assets. So for us, you know, being a, you know, a special needs, you know, planning firm, it's about having the money in the right buckets. And so, and furthermore, I just want to take it a step further when it comes to financial planning. Um, we tend to put things in buckets, right? Uh, it's like, here's my retirement and here's the special needs planning for my child and, and what have you. But really uh, it's one big it's kind of one big bucket. So if you're married, uh, it's likely that you're going to need to spend 25 to 35 years in retirement. That's a long time. That's a lot of money that you need for retirement. But when you have a special needs child that's going to need care for the rest of their life, it's like a third retirement. So making sure that we have the money in the right buckets to make sure that we don't accidentally disqualify our child from benefits in the future is critically important. And we see some real big mistakes that people make. And it's inadvertent. It's not because their financial planner is just crazy. It's not because they're not smart. I mean, we see doctors and engineers and lawyers and what have you make these little mistakes that cost big. So that's why. That makes sense. Wow. I never thought of that. A third 
retirement. That that's so true. So um and so how does that uh, differ from um uh, the financial planner, a special needs financial planner, and then um a special needs attorney? So I'm gonna need a special needs attorney for my kiddo for you know guardianship and probate court. Tell me tell me how that's different from what you do. So I get that question a lot. That's a really great question. Um, so in in short, they're the paper and we're the money. Okay. So the special needs planning attorney, why and same thing. Um, why can't I just go to any attorney or my family attorney or whatever? We advise against that. We really suggest that you go with a special needs planning attorney. You know, we attend a, a UT law conference uh, annually, and they're really talking about the changes as it relates to special needs and the law and, and et cetera. And the special needs planning attorney are really, really versed in all of those things. So that way, when your documents are created, they're valid, they're good, and, and they they stand the test of the Social Security Administration, which is, is really, really important. So, um, and, and this would be a really good time for me to say that um, we are not fans of the, I, I love D, DYI stuff, you know, um, do it yourself, but when it comes to special needs planning and, and the law and the legal documents and things like that, this is not something that you want to skimp on. And, and do it yourself or hire somebody that is, is is not trained. So they're the paper, they're the legal documents. When it comes to a special needs trust, it's about funding. How are we going to fund the care for this special needs child? So uh, we work very closely with the special needs attorneys and they create the documents, we create the funding and kind of figure out how it all, all comes together. Well, that makes perfect sense. Um, yes, it's certainly not when you want to pull out your guest bedroom and flip it yourself. So that makes perfect sense. So uh, what's the worst thing that can happen to my child's government benefits? I know there's just so much misinformation. Um, I have families that say, oh, we'll never qualify because of what we make. And then additionally, he can't go to work or get SSI. So kind of what are the things that can happen to your kiddos benefits? So, I mean, the I guess there, there, that's a loaded question. There's a lot of things that can happen, happen <laughs> right. to your kids' benefits. So the first things first, I said it a minute ago. Um, while it's true, many families don't qualify. Their child is a minor. Their child is clearly disabled. And, and I've actually had people very upset, even cry, that, I, what do you mean he's not disabled? He doesn't walk. He doesn't talk. He does, you know, and, and it has nothing to do with that because SSI is a means-based program and it has to do with the parent's assets until the, ter um, the child turns 18. And then it's based off of the child's assets. But a lot of things can happen. Um, you can, um, you know, some things, some things happen accidentally with grandma and grandpa. Grandma and grandpa pass away and they leave the special needs individual a large sum of money in, uh, to that individual directly as opposed to a special needs trust, okay? So a special needs trust is a way that you can leave a special needs individual large sums of money that won't be counted against them um, for SSI. So that that is one reason. But another thing that we see very commonly, unfortunately, is child support. Um, oftentimes we see in the state of Texas that child support continues past age 18 for, um, for a special needs child. And, um, you know, working with a, a, a regular divorce attorney, they don't work with special needs that much. They don't really know the importance of directing that child support to a special needs trust because as soon as the child turns 18, it needs to go to a special needs trust or it's going to be counted um, as it relates to SSI. And it could put you in a position to where not only do you disqualify, but it could take uh, it could take the Social Security Administration administration a couple years uh, to figure out, oh, snap, you weren't supposed to be getting this. And then they send you a letter saying you owe us thousands upon thousands of dollars. So that that is a bad scenario. I, I'm not sure if it's the worst case scenario. It's one of the worst. Um, right. so, so that's, that is a big deal. But another big deal for a, a lot of families is that, um, not only do you lose this SSI and SSI right now is 794 a month, but when you qualify for SSI, you also qualify for Medicaid. So many families have their children on their group benefits and then Medicaid is kind of secondary. But for a family that's relying on Medicaid for their child's health care, this is extremely problematic. So that is an issue. And for, for right now, what I, I, I do want to mention um, as it relates to special needs planning, um, a lot of our families don't know, uh, but they could actually keep their special needs child on their group benefits past age 26. 
So um, it's something that you talk to HR about, and that can definitely happen for families. A lot of companies don't promote that, and if you don't ask, they don't mention it. But um, that is an option for many families that we like to share for sure. That's so good. Yeah, that's so, so good. So uh, so a kiddo is um, greatly impacted by their comorbidities or their disability. They're, they're medically fragile. Um, um, they're going to need um, care and funding and support for their entire life. So how do I fund this to make sure that it happens um, after I'm not here anymore? Well, I think um, I think first it's important to um, to establish a, a special care plan, and this is where you're working with um, a, a special needs planner. And quite honestly, we do a lot of listening of what's important to the family, what they envision care will look like. Um, care is different for everyone, so some sometimes it's it's residential care, partial residential care, group homes, other. I mean, there's so many different things. Um, so, so what we do is we help determine how much money is needed. Okay. How much money are we going to need in the future for this? And then, um, and then we look at the whole big picture, like the whole bucket I was talking about before and saying, okay, what do these people need for retirement? What do they need for other things in their life while they're alive? How much of their current assets can they allocate towards special care? Right. And some people have significant assets that they can, you know, put towards special care. But many families need the money that they've saved over a 25 or 35 year career to fund their 25 to 35 years of retirement. So in that example, a lot of um, families pay for care out of out with their current assets, their current annual income, and even in retirement, their retirement assets. And then upon their death, life insurance funds the trust. Okay, so if we have a gap um, in what, you know, if, if let's say, for instance, the the child's uh, long term needs are going to be two point five million dollars over over a 30 year period. So part of it will be funded from assets and the other part of it is often funded from life insurance. Okay. And, and and the key to that, I have to say, is that the trust, the special needs trust is the beneficiary of the life insurance, not your special needs loved one individually. So that's the key to funding. Okay, perfect. And this is just a, a side question, just because I get it a lot. And I think people mean well, um, but you know, I, I have families that have a, a seven-year-old and a three-year-old and they'll be like, the three-year-old's going to take care of the seven-year-old forever. And while well, that sounds great, um, you know, obviously you're, you're the bucket. Um, obviously that's conversation that has to, or it, it happens. What does that look like when parents are asking you directives in that, or they're saying, um, this is my daughter has a disability and we have one other child and that other child is going to take care of everything. So we like to caution families against that. Um, and so it's not that we're raining on, on your parade or anything like that. Yeah. But um, what I like to say is let's, let's take a step back and think about how were you when you were 18, 20, 22, 23? Did you have hopes and dreams? Did you want to get married? Did you want to have a house? Did you want to have kids? Did you have a vision of your life? Did you want to go to college? Um, I mean, there's so many things, hopes and dreams that people have. And so I think that, um, you know, I hear people say, well, you know, our daughter is definitely going to do that or whatever. She really loves her brother. And, and, and we know that, and we know that families love each other and things like that, but it, what we see happening is the obligatory, yes, I will be happy to do that, but they don't mean that. And then there's this, um, there's this rift, this, um, it, 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 it's, it's not healthy, right? Because the other person's life is going on hold and they may not be able to get married or keep a relationship or other things like that for people saying, hey, that's a little bit too much for me. I can't handle that. So what we really love to see is siblings being successor trustees of the special needs trust and help, they will help navigate the future care of their loved one. They can okay. be that sibling and that friend and that person that shows up, their person, right? Without the daily um, in the trenches. So they, they're still living their life. The, the loved one is living a happy life and, and they're um, amongst um, people, they're working, they're, they're having, um, relationships and friendships and things like that that are important but that sibling bond is still there without resentment so that's what we like to like to think about right that's so good 
um, without, yes, without resentment, because we don't want um, a seven-year-old to go, hey, you're already a parent. So that is a lot of responsibility. Um, so <clears throat> should I consider an ABLE account and kind of what is it? You know, it came out, it was going to be the end all be all, but it's not happening. It did happen. Tell us what that is and um, who it's applicable to. So um, the ABLE account came out in 2014 and it's under the 520. 529A. So we're kind of familiar with the college plans, the 529C. So 2014, the ABLE account um, came out, 529A, and it is for individuals whose disability began prior to age 26. It doesn't mean you have to get the ABLE account prior to 20, age 26, but it is for um, the disability began prior to age 26. So an ABLE account um, you know, it, it's tax, it, it's tax favored, right? So um, it's a way to put money in an account up to $100,000 total, $15,000 a year, okay, you can only put $15,000 a year, and it will not disqualify you from SSI. So here's another bucket of money that doesn't disqualify disqualify you from SSI. So the magic number is 2000 if, if you're single or $3,000 if you're married. Okay. You can have one house and one car and not disqualify from, um, from SSI. So you can have up to a total of $100,000 in an ABLE account, up to $15,000 a year, and you can have an unlimited amount of money, millions of dollars in a special needs trust. So the buckets are, and your regular checking or savings are all other sources, as long as your assets are less than $2,000. And then the other buckets are the ABLE account and the special needs trust. Basically, other than that, that's where the money goes. And if you have the money anywhere else, and it's in the individual's name, you're going to disqualify from SSI. That's the rules as it is right now. Okay, so you don't recommend putting money under the mattress. We don't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's probably a bad idea. But one of the things that I will tell you about the ABLE account that I think is awesome is, you know, we have a lot of families that have um, that have 529 Cs for their for their kids, and then their kids may or may not be going to to college. So um, with a 529C, you can convert $15,000 a year to the ABLE account. That um, that law changed in 2018. So if you're wanting to move some from the 529C to the ABLE, you can definitely do that. But the ABLE account can pay for so many things, including college, including tutoring. And it's, it's about achieving a better life for an individual with disabilities. That's what the ABLE account is for. So there is so many things that um, is are considered achieving a better life. It could be vacationing. It could be an iPhone. It could be a computer. It could, I mean, whatever it is, it could be healthcare needs or what have you. So basically the list for an ABLE account is long of what you can pay for um, out of it. Now, one question that we get all the time, Karen, is, excuse me, why do I need a special needs trust and an ABLE account? Right. And that is a really great question. And in short, um, basically you can pay for food and housing out of an ABLE account. You can pay for rent or mortgage payments out of an ABLE account, and you really can't pay for, um, food and shelter out of a special needs trust. Um, that I have seen over the years, I have seen some residential facilities that bill it as medical as opposed to room and board. And in that way, it might be, it might be as questionable, but it might be able to be paid out of a, a special needs trust. But but the ABLE account, you can. So unless you're paying for a house outright, um, the ABLE account is a great place to pay rent. Because honestly, so let's just say for a moment, you're a parent and your special needs child lives in a group home and you are paying the rent for them. I'll just pay it. I'll just pay it myself. That could be construed as income for them and affect their SSI. So it, it's pretty important that you... Um, kind of figure these things out and kind of learn about the ABLE account and the special needs trust and how to, how to use them. So it's not counted against them for income. Or instead of me learning about it, I could go to a professional like you. For sure. For, for sure. sure for sure. Um, and then of course, what is the letter? What is a letter of intent? Does that mean you're going to play football for UCLA? What does that mean? <laughs> for sure. Uh, the, the letter of intent, um, I, I kind of like a term of endearment for me is a, 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 the family love letter, right? It's kind of a family love letter. Um, you know, as parents, we know everything. We eat, sleep, and breathe 
um, our kid. We, we know them backwards and forwards. We know their routines. They, we know what makes them tick. We know what makes them melt down. Every medicine that they take, every doctor that they've ever seen, the school this, that they've been to, everything about them, it's all in our head. But if, if I'm incapacitated or if I'm gone, who knows this stuff, okay? So a letter of intent is really um, documenting and, and highlighting all of these things as it relates to your special needs loved one. Um, so that way, if, if someone else is stepping into your shoes, you're incapacitated or you're, you're no longer here on this earth, they pick up this document and they basically know what to do. And it can be as personal or impersonal as you want it to be. We find them th to be very personal. We do have a template for that. Um, it's, it's interesting. It's 19 pages. It sounds crazy. It's a form fillable letter of intent template. What we tell families is, um, you know, certainly you can create this yourself. You can put it in a notebook, and in, in a notebook which we don't recommend because you know, it requires updates. So, you know, creating a Word document, we share our letter of intent with our clients so they can do that themselves. But it talks about religious affiliations. It talks about, you know, what county were they born in? What hospital were they born in? I mean, it's just, it's it's really, really, um, it's really extensive. And um, and it can be emotional, like when you're, we're, when you're going through this. So what I tell people is if you don't have a letter of intent, it's okay. Um, just get started. Okay. It's not something that you're going to sit down one afternoon with a cup of coffee and you're going to knock it, knock it all out, but you know, give yourself some grace. I want to get this done in the next three to six months or something like that and work on it at a little bit at a time. And then what we say is come back and revisit it, you know, at least twice a year. Um, we've got some complex kids that, uh, their care needs are ever changing. And in that regard, you might want to, um, update it, a, you know, a little bit more frequently. But then the other um, key thing is let somebody know where this is. <laughs> so yeah, you know, because if you do this and it's just, you know, I did this and I have this great thing and I have it filed away in my little file cabinet or I have it filed away on my computer, you need to let your um, successor trustee, your beneficiaries or somebody that's important to you that knows where everything is, um, you know, where this is at. Perfect. Um, and I had a question uh, I had. Um, so what about uh, grandparents or Aunt Myrtle who means well and wants to leave something for Billy Smith because uh, they have a disability and then they just write it separately in their will? And of course, their intention is because, you know, they'll need more support. Is that can that be changed um, via the executor when um, funds are dispensed or does that sort of blow it? Well, it's problematic. It, it, it's problematic. And at that point, they're going to need an attorney. And that attorney and is basically going to need to go before a judge to get that money directed. And, and at this point, it would be a first party special needs trust as opposed to a third party. And I want to just talk about that for a second. So a first party special needs trust is money of the individual, okay, with disabilities. And um, the, the key difference to a first party and a third party, the first party has a Medicaid payback. So does an ABLE account. So if the individual passes away, there is a Medicaid payback. So um, an attorney would have to petition the courts to get a judge to sign off to have it directed to a first party special needs trust. And hopefully that that would go well. I mean, typically we wouldn't think that it wouldn't, but there's an expense to that. I mean, you have to hire an attorney you're at the mercy of a judge. And so, so that's the process for that to, to get it redirected. Um, so a lot of the attorneys that we refer to and that we work with, um, work with families and talking to them about how to talk to their loved ones. It's not assuming, you know, uh, you're going to give us tons of money or, you know, I, I know you're going to give us a lot of money and we're going to inherit this. So I want to tell you how to do it. It's not like that. But it's just basically telling your loved ones, hey, um, we've basically been going through this special needs planning process and we learned a whole list of ways of how it can hurt Billy uh, if we leave money directly to him. And we've learned the proper ways to leave um, money to him in the future via a special needs trust that will not you know, cause him to lose benefits in the future. And we want to just share this with you. And we've actually even seen um, some attorneys that have like a nice letter that you can send your families that explains everything. And it, so it's not assuming or, you know, anything like that. What we do see is a lot of um, grandparents and um, aunts and uncles and stuff. They're also very um, 
private. These are private matters. And so it's kind of sometimes it's a little awkward to bring bring these things up. So that letter or kind of bringing up the fact that you've been going through the planning process and that you've learned this stuff is very helpful. They love their loved one as well, and they don't want to mess anything up. But it's, you know, they're, some of them are working in a small town area and they're not working with special needs planners. They're not working with a special needs planning attorney. And they just, they simply just don't know what they don't know. So we have to educate them. Right. That's, that's good information. No, it is very private and you would be surprised how well successful people have not planned the end. So um, Allison's covered always a pleasure to be with you and train with you again. Um, you are just a wealth of information. Um, again, tell um, our listeners how they can get a hold of you, um, your services at Consolidated Planning. Sure. Um, you guys can reach out to us directly at um, a scoberg at cpgcares.net. Um, our phone number is 281-690-1177. Um, we have a Facebook page, a website, Consolidated Planning Group, and um, we also have a, a YouTube channel. We we are um, been putting out a, a lot of educational events as it relates to special needs planning because we really want to put the tools and resources um, in, in families' hands because we know that they all have all these full-time jobs that they're doing and life is tough. So um, our, our YouTube channel is, is out there and just everything you can think of, ABLE accounts, special needs trust, uh, social security, SSI, Medicaid, Medicare, kind of all of those topics. So um, certainly um, check that out. And Karen, um, thank you so much for um, for having us today. And it's always uh, so nice to chat with you, and we we really, really, really love what you're doing with families, and and as far as the advocacy, in, you know, in the education setting, we've just seen so much, um, so much change and so much challenge, especially with the pandemic, and it's um, encouraging to us to know that we have someone like you that we can refer our families to, because even though we're on the financial side and, and special needs planning side, the whole nine yards, um, one of the topics that comes up every single conversation is education, whether it's to, how do we pay for a special needs school, whether, whether it's where are we going post high school transition, or you know we're in the school and, and we're having some issues and we, and we need help. Oh my gosh, every single day. So um, we're so happy, um, so, so happy to have, have you as a resource. Well, thank you, Allison. So again, Allison Spaberg, um, consolidatedplanninggroup.com. Please avail yourself of that. Facebook, YouTube, all the platforms. Again, if you guys have any other questions or you want more information about Allison and her group, you can always reach out to me at Karen at specialeducationboss.com. Again, um, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so that you know anytime we go live or put out a video. And remember, when we get it right for the child, we get it right for everyone. We'll see you guys in the next video.